Hello, and welcome to your last lecture of the semester. This is the last topic we'll cover before the final exam. Um, we have no readings for next week. Um, I will be having a review session, so information about that will be coming out soon in an announcement on Canvas. Um, so have questions prepared. I won't come with a list of what to study. I will only be there to answer any questions that you have. You can also, as always, ask questions in the discussion thread, questions for Rachel. Um, the I'll cover my announcements in the next page, actually. Hold on. Okay. Um, the grades for analysis assignment one are either posted or if you haven't gotten yours yet, will be posted by tomorrow evening. If you've already turned in your analysis assignment two and you want to update it based on feedback you received from your first analysis assignment, you are welcome to do so. If you haven't turned in your second analysis assignment, you, ne you need to turn one in either on private government, which is by this upcoming Friday, or on censorship, which is the topic we're covering today, by next Friday. You absolutely have to turn in your second assignment by next Friday, um, which I think is May 6th. Let me double check. Might be May 8th. It's the 8th. May 8th. Um, if you want to write your second analysis assignment on a topic that you've missed the deadline for, contact me and we can work something out. Um, on that note, make up your missed work. All of the assignments are still open, um, so if you turn them in, it's better to get some credit than no credit at all. I have to give you a zero if you turn nothing in. Um, I'm happy to give you partial credit for late assignments turned in at this point. Also, if you're worried about your grade, don't forget that there is an extra credit assignment available. Um, this is on the reparations reading that we had intended on doing, um, but was canceled. So details about that can be found on Canvas. That is due on May 6th. Um, and like I mentioned, we're going to talk about the final exam that will be posted on May 8th and will be available until May 12th. I can't be super flexible with this deadline because I have to get the grades in by the 15th. That being said, in emergency situations, please reach out to me so that we can work something out. We could even talk about potentially, um, giving you an incomplete so you can finish the work over the summer. Um, if you have any questions about any of these assignments, any grades that you have, or um, making up missed work, just reach out to me and we'll get it figured out. Today, we're going to be talking about scorekeeping in a pornographic language game. This is going to tie into our conversation about uh, um, political philosophy because we're going to be talking about censorship. Um, with me today is one of the current MA students in the philosophy program. He works on philosophy of language, and he's going to help me give this lecture today. So the other voice is Ethan Higginbotham in the philosophy department. Do you want to say hi? Hi, that's me. That's, yeah, hi. Great, so I'll let him take over. Um, I'm also going to be um, helping him out. Let's go. Let's start. Okay. Great. So yeah, as she said, <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about scorekeeping in a pornographic language game. Um, and it is by Ray Langton and Carolyn West. Uh, Langton on the top, correct, mm -hmm. uh, is from Cambridge and West is from University of Sydney, Australia. Um, yeah, both very big deals. Yep. They are... Um... Yeah, unimportant. Never mind. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, very good. And this paper is really cool because it ties in the political philosophy side of things with some stuff from philosophy of language, which is why I'm here, basically. Mm -hmm. So yeah, some background about what they're talking about. Uh, the basic question that they're trying to work with is, um, should some types, as it said, should some types of pornography be banned or censored by the government? Um, this has been debated in the courts all the way up to the Supreme Court, um, so they want to fill in the discussion a little bit more. Right. And the general thinking is that it shouldn't be censored because it's going to fit under some sort of free speech defense. 
Um, that's the defense that has been used. So it's the assumption they're going to work with. They're going to go in talking about that, uh, that tactic to defend it. Um, and the way that they do that is they see, well, if it's going to count as, or if freedom of speech is going to defend pornography in this case, uh, it must be some kind of speech. And if it's some kind of speech, what is it saying? And then, so there are some accounts of what it's saying. So Dworkin's account, uh, he says, porn explicitly attempts to persuade audiences that women are inferior slash like to be dominated or at least should be treated in this way. That's one account of what porn might be saying. Uh, there's another, which is by uh, McKinnon and Scotia. Yeah, I think it's Danny Scotia. Um, that porn is speech uh, that works by psychological conditioning. So the idea here is that porn doesn't explicitly attempt to convince you of anything or explicitly provide the messages um, that historically feminists have been saying about porn, but instead is working in a sort of Pavlovian way um, to condition specifically men um, to to reacting to certain things in a positive way when they're actually negative. They provide um, an experiment which they think, um, Catherine McKinnon and Danny Scotia, um, think um, provides evidence for this. This is the Black Boots experiment. Um, the idea behind the experiment is that researchers um, took heterosexual male students from university. They paired slides of sexually provocative women with picture with pictures of a pair of black knee-length women's boots, they were able to successfully create a mild boot fetish in these students. Um, in other words, the black boots, when, when shown by themselves, became somewhat sexually arousing. There was even a slight tendency to generalize to other sorts of footwear in the students from this experiment. So this might seem to provide some sort of... Um, reason to believe that porn is working in this sort of Pavlovian way. Um, but as we're going to talk about in a second, Langton and West think that there's probably, it's probably most likely that it's some sort of middle ground between purely psychological conditioning and this explicit attempt to convince you of something. Right. Okay. So looking at specifically Langton and West's position, um, they say here, uh, if pornography is speech, then we can expect it to be at least partly continuous with other forms of human communication and to produce its effects on beliefs, desires, and behavior in a manner that is not utterly different from other speech. So essentially, if it's speech, it's going to work like other speech. And what they mean by that is that it's saying something. Yeah. In a very normal sense, saying things yeah. is what speech does. Yeah. So yeah, and they're going to go from that, uh, that claim about speech uh, and connect that forward to the feminist claims about uh, whether porn is subordinating and silencing women. I want to make a brief note about the type of porn that Langton and West are right. talking about. Um, they mention this in a footnote. I wish they had been slightly more explicit about this. LOL, punny. Um, okay, sorry. Um <laughs> But they're, <laughs> they're talking about a very specific type of porn. Um, arguably, um, some feminists, as some feminists have argued, the type of porn they're talking about is going to ultimately capture all of the mainstream types of porn. Um, however, um, you may be familiar with some of the less popular types of porn, such as what's called feminist porn. Um, they're specifically talking about porn in which women, um, are degraded, um, dominated, um, humiliated, hurt, um, or in its most, um, obvious example, raped in what we're going to later call, um, favorable rape porn. Right. So that's the specific type of porn they're talking about here. Yeah. So it's a question of whether that's going to apply to all types of porn. If you're not inclined to think it is out the gate, that's okay. They're at least talking about some type of porn, yeah. not specifically. So if you think that not all types of porn um, shows women in these 
vulnerable situations, we'll say, um, just limit limit the scope of their argument to these these specific types of porn. Correct. Okay, so there's kind of two, there's a fork in the road that they get to right out the gate. Um, when you're talking about porn being defended from censorship on this kind of free speech grounds, um, well, it's either going to need, need to fit into one of these two categories. Um, one case is that porn isn't speech so that that de uh, defense isn't going to make sense. Um, and then censorship for censorship isn't going to be prevented by a free speech defense. On the other hand, if it is going to be defended in this way, porn must be speech. But if it is speech, we can ask, what does it say? Um, and does it silence and subordinate women um, in the ways that have been claimed? Mm -hmm. They are ultimately, as we're going to see in a minute, just assume that porn is speech because they think that this is the best um, argument against censorship. So out the gate, they're assuming that porn is speech. They're going to ask, what is it saying? Um, and does it silence and subordinate women? However, if you don't think that porn is speech, all they're going to say back to you is, well, cool, then the First Amendment doesn't protect against censorship in the case of porn. Um, that's why they're assuming from the get-go that porn is speech. All right. Did you have something? Okay. Um, yeah, so just to lay out the general shape of how this article is going to go, um, they're going to start with the initial question, does porn say anything at all? Um, if it does, what is it that it says? Um, from there, does it have power over us in some kind of relevant way, changing uh, behaviors, desires, beliefs, what have you? And then... Another question, does it say that women are inferior or that sexual violence is legitimate? Those are kind of the main questions that the various parts of this are going to seek to address. And then they'll handle a couple of objections. So the first being that porn doesn't say anything explicitly or directly. Uh, and then the second is that porn is merely a fiction. It's, it's just not real. So those are the two kind of arguments against it they're going to try to handle. Yep, so um, as we mentioned, this first question, they're assuming that um, porn does say something, since they're assuming it's speech, um, having no reason to think that porn as speech would function any differently than every other type of speech. Um, the primary purpose of speech is to say something. They assume that speech, I mean, porn does say something. So um, this first question we tackled in that last slide. I know that's kind of confusing and I apologize. Um, so we're going to quickly move to that second question, um, and we're going to kind of do some jumping around. The reason I've laid it out like this um, is so you can easily get all the different parts, even if they kind of mash the parts up together. Right. And this will follow well with reading the paper. It's, yeah. It matches the structure of the paper, so it's a good way to follow it. Okay, so first things first. Um, they're going to talk about speech acts a lot in this, and I figure that might be a new concept, so I'll explain it. It's pretty simple. Basically, a speech act is when you more or less do something by saying something. So some of the classic examples are uh, when someone officiating a wedding says, I now pronounce you man and wife, um, they are actually doing the action of marrying those two people, uh, saying I now pronounce you, blah, 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 does something. It marries the people. Um, alternatively, like proposing, uh, saying, will you marry me? That is, that is proposing. Um, also, if you like christen a ship or giving something a name, you're saying, I, I dub the so-and-so. You've given the thing a name. You've actually done an action. So that's what a speech act is. Um, and they're going to say that porn is is functioning as a speech act. Building off of McKinnon originally. Right. Claiming that porn is a speech act in court. Right. So specifically, well, here's McKinnon on that. Um, yeah. Porn is acting as a speech act. And then here's the, here's the reason. Together with all its material supports, 
Authoritatively saying something is inferior is largely how structures of status and differential treatment are demarcated and actualized. Words and images are how people are placed in hierarchies, how social stratification is made to seem inevitable and right, how feelings of inferiority are engendered, and how indifference to violence against those on the bottom is rationalized and normalized. So, basically, given that porn's a speech act, uh, it's going to fit into these hierarchies and perpetuate injustices in this kind of a way. Yeah, so in other words, just to, just to reiterate and simplify that, what McKinnon is claiming and what Langton and West are going to build on and explore more deeply um, is that porn is a speech act. Specifically, it's a speech act that creates and or upholds social hierarchies specifically by silencing and subordinating women. So they're taking this claim by McKinnon that porn is saying something that is making it the case that women are silenced and subordinated. They're going to fill out the how. They're going to ask, is this the case? And if so, how is it the case? Good. Okay, so one of the things that needs to be addressed is the thinking that porn doesn't explicitly say anything. Um, there is no direct uh, speaking to the audience that happens, at least not of any thesis statement. Um, the issue with that thinking, though, is that the things that are said do not match the things that are said explicitly. More things are said in a general sense than are said directly like this. Uh, some of those things are going to be the presuppositions that are assumed when you, uh, for what you say. So for example, if I say that the present king of France is bald, that holds a presupposition that there presently is a king of France. Uh, but it explicitly tells you that that king of France is bald. So I didn't tell you there's a king of France explicitly, but it is presupposed in what I've said, so it counts as a thing I'm saying more generally. Yeah, so this serves as an example in that what is explicitly said is less in scope than the things that are actually said. Right. Yeah. One more example. Um, if I say that that joke is as bad as Harry's, um, that takes as a presupposition that Harry tells bad jokes. Um, so I haven't, I haven't said anything about Harry's jokes here. I've just compared some other joke to them, but it is presupposed, given the way I've said it, that Harry tells bad jokes generally. In other words, he's implying that Harry is um, bad at jokes. Um, in, that is taken up as something that he's saying, even though he's not directly saying it. Right, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that uptake works in a minute. Right now, actually. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Um, all of this is coming out of something by a different author in just purely philosophy of language, um, David Lewis. So his paper, confusingly, is called Scorekeeping in a Language Game. That's where they get the, the name. Thing. Yeah, um, yeah, very intentionally titled. Uh, but... So on this, Lewis says, uh, to say something in a speech situation is more than to utter a string of words with a sense and reference. It is to make a certain move in a language game. Uh, what Lewis calls the score of the language game adjusts itself in response to the moves speakers make, and the later moves that a speaker can make are in turn dependent upon the prior score of the game. So that's kind of the nitty gritty that we're about to explain. Yep, that's super complicated, and we're going to explain how it works um, in the same way that Lewis does, by comparing a game of baseball with what... Um, with a language game. Yeah, what Lewis calls a language game and what Langton and West are continuing to call the language game. Right, which also you could think of as like a conversation. That would count as mm -hmm. one kind of language game. So, okay. One hand we've got baseball, one hand we have a language game. So as far as the score of a baseball game goes, it's built up out of various numbers. Um, you've got the runs, you've got what inning you're in, how many strikes, how many balls, etc. Many numbers, you can 
you can tell the entire score of a baseball game, the entire situation. The score lets you know what is going on. Exactly. Similarly, in a language game, you have a kind of score as well, uh, but it's built out of these constructs. So you've got the various uh, presuppositions, um, social norms, other things like those. That help you understand what is going on in, for example, a conversation. Right. So back to baseball, but this is going to, you'll see the connections. Um, these rules help to determine correct play. So what you can do at one moment versus what you can do at another moment is determined by the score. Yeah, so I think that there are two parts to this that we need to mention. So first is that there are rules in a baseball game. What's appropriate to do is laid out. There are, there are appropriate and inappropriate ways to act in a baseball game. Right. But even further than that, what is, correct, uh, what is the correct way to play at one point in time is different from what's appropriate to play at another point in time. Right. So... In the example we've got here, if you've if there are two strikes already, the correct thing to do, all things being equal, is another another pitch. Um, versus if there are three strikes, you're not supposed to pitch to the same batter. That would not be a correct play. So you can see how um, what just happened or what has previously happened in the game um, dictates, in a sense. What's, a, what's the appropriate next move? Right. And given that our score is, a, is just a list of these numbers, um, and the score tells us what just happened, the more, when you change those numbers in the relevant ways, it changes what you can do. Similarly, um, rules determine correct play in language games as well. So what counts as, like, the correct thing to say to a marriage proposal is not going to count as the correct thing to say. Yeah. As a comment to the weather. So, so again, there are rules, just like in baseball. Um, I'm allowed to respond in certain ways to questions, um, but depending on what question was asked, I, I'm allowed to respond in different ways. So like Ethan said, if someone says, will you marry me? It's not really appropriate for me to change the topic, whereas if someone asked me if I prefer hot or cold weather, no one would really blink an eye if I tried to change, change the topic. Yeah. Certain things are acceptable at certain times when they're really not at other times. Yeah. The, the, the big point you're supposed to get here is that just like baseball, language follows a set of rules, and those rules depend upon what's happened previously to the current moment. Right, and how you can and, change things. Yeah, so and speak. determines what's appropriate to do next. Yeah. Okay, one dissimilarity that we'll get into is that... Um, Baseball doesn't really make everything count as correct. The rules of baseball aren't such that they try to interpret the things you do as correct no matter what. In other words, the rules of baseball are rigid. You are either correct or you're incorrect, but it doesn't attempt to take any action on your behalf and make it correct. Right. So, for example... If you walk to first base after three balls have been pitched to you, um, that's just always wrong. You need There need to be four. Um, people aren't going to try to interpret what you did as correct in some other kind of way. And that's because baseball is not governed by this rule of accommodation, which we'll get into in a minute. On the other hand, uh, language does try to interpret things more generously, I guess you could say. It's less rigid uh, because it is governed by, governed by the rule of accommodation. So if one person says uh, that test was very easy and then... And I respond yeah. by saying, yeah, even Jane could pass. Yeah. Suddenly that seems on one hand kind of weird. We weren't talking about Jane before. So he's going to change what he understands um, about what we were talking about so that what I said made sense. 
We're going to cover that in more detail in just a second. Right. So, okay. First of the two things we just said, we'll explain rule of accommodation. So, um, it's basically this. If at, an, if at a given time something is said that requires a component of conversational score to be a certain way in order for what is said to be true or otherwise acceptable, and if that component is not that way beforehand, and if certain further conditions hold, um, then at that time that score component changes in the required way to make what is said true or otherwise acceptable. So to clarify that, in other words, if what I said only makes sense if other things are taken to be the case, we're just going to grant those other things so that what I said makes sense. Yeah. So to just reiterate what it says on the slide, if someone says something which requires a missing presupposition or a background assumption and no one challenges it, importantly, that presupposition is immediately established as part of the score, making the move count as correct play. So unless someone challenges what I say, when I say even Jane could pass, it's taken as accepted. Um, that Jane wouldn't have passed normally. That Jane is incompetent or a bad student or often doesn't pass. Right. So you need the background information. Jane is incompetent. Jane often fails. Jane is a bad student. In order to make sense of my statement, even Jane could pass, um, if Ethan doesn't say, what do you mean? I like Jane. Um, if he just moves on, our conversation has now made it the case that Jane being incompetent is a background assumption. Yeah or what is technically called this presupposition. Right, we update our list of things that are just presupposed yeah. in this kind of way. But importantly, to reiterate, if someone challenges it, it doesn't necessarily update with that new presupposition. Right, which will so important. if Ethan says... Yeah, like, that doesn't make sense, Jane's really smart, something like that. Yeah, then the conversation, what I just said doesn't make sense. We have not added Jane is incompetent to our presuppositions. Right. But it might be harder to challenge um, presuppositions than things that are said outright. If I just outright said, even Jane could pass and Jane's just incompetent. That would be much easier to address where she said Jane is incompetent. I could say... No, that's not the case. But if I just say even Jane could pass, not only am I presupposing that Jane is incompetent, but I'm suggesting that that should be taken for granted. I'm suggesting that it's common knowledge in a way that makes it very hard to challenge. Right. You're Yeah, you're not only saying she's incompetent, you're also saying everybody knows she's incompetent. It's so obvious that I don't even need to tell you. Yep. That sort of idea which those things very hard to question people on. Importantly, this, by me saying even Jane could pass, I'm not merely bringing in the presupposition that Jane is incompetent. I might also be giving permission or legitimating further jokes on at Jane's expense, um, further digs at Jane's ability as a student, et cetera, et cetera. So um, by adding presuppositions, you're doing more than just updating um, the background assumptions. You're also giving permissions and putting limits on what's appropriate to do afterwards. All right. Oh, yeah, you take this one. Okay. So how do these presuppositions work in porn, at least according to Langton and West? Um, well... To quote them, they say, while it may not explicitly be said in pornography that women are inferior or that sexual violence is normal or legitimate, it may be that propositions like these are presupposed by what pornography explicitly says because they are required for the hearer to make best sense of what is said. Um, this quote basically means that in order to make sense of what happens in porn, at least the sorts of porn that LinkedIn and West are talking about, you need to internalize some sort of background assumption 
um, that women are inferior or that sexual violence is normal or legitimate in the same way um, that the even Jane could pass is adding that Jane is incompetent. This is best explained with an example, but I want to mention right now that the example I'm going to go into um, is slightly explicit in terms of um, sexual violence. I'm going to keep it broad, but you're welcome to skip forward about three minutes um, if you don't want to hear what I'm about to say. So the example um, is from the magazine Hustler. It was entitled Dirty Pool. Um, in it, there is a waitress at a pool bar, um, some men at, who are playing pool, pinch her on the behind, and she acts like she doesn't like it, she acts put off, um, she vocally, um, says that she's not interested in that sort of attention. However, the men in the story know that she's really just playing hard to get. Um, she really wants um, to be dominated. Um, so they gang rape her. And at the end, um, she explodes in this phenomenal orgasm. They generalize this to other sorts of what they call favorable rape depictions, where women are shown initially um, declining the advances of men, um, often physically or very strongly, but in the end it winds up being the case that they enjoyed the um, interaction or that they, they didn't really mean no. Now, it's important to mention that it's not explicitly said in the story that the waitress says no when she really means yes, or that despite her pr protest to the contrary, she really wanted to be raped and dominated all along, and that she was there as an object for the men's sexual gratification, or that raping a woman is sexy and erotic for men and women alike. It's not explicitly said. However, one needs these presuppositions in order to make sense of the way in which the initially, hold on, a pop-up popped up, okay, in which the initially reluctant young waitress gives into immediate ecstasy upon being gang raped. If you don't um, bring in harmful rape myths, then the story doesn't make sense. So, to quote Langton and West, Although the story does not explicitly assert the propositions, gang rape is enjoyable for men, or gang rape is enjoyable for women, or sexual violence is legitimate, such messages are arguably presupposed by it. In other words, they are needed in order to make sense of the story. This gets them to their first conclusion. Pornography can say harmful things, even if it doesn't say them explicitly. Pornography can suggest or say um, that sexual violence is legitimate, um, or that women don't really mean no when they say no, implicitly with, with these presuppositions. Cool. Um, I want to mention now that I will no longer be going into detail about the um, dirty pool example. Here is a good place to come back if you were waiting. Okay. Um, they go into some talks about authority next. So this is connecting to the, um, what we said earlier is the feminist claim. Is that how we labeled it earlier? Sorry. That, yeah. um, that porn subordinates and silences women. Right. Yes. yes. This is a traditionally feminist claim. Yes. Uh, their point is it can only do these things if it says the things it has to say with some kind of authority. So in order to make the point that porn subordinates and silences women, you have to make the point that porn says harmful things with authority. So that's what they're going to try to fill in here. Um, I first want to mention that although it's not the way that Langton and West go, I think you can also take um, porn as an authority, um, as many do, because it often serves as the first introduction and their so therefore a sort of handbook or how-to guide for sex, um, but that's not the way that Langton and West are going to show that porn has authority. Okay. So, um, <laughs> okay, so, <clears throat> 
to fill in and determine who has authority when it comes to language games, they mentioned that the success of the rule of accommodation depends on who the speaker is. So if you take, for example, um, a master and a slave, the master is able to change what is permissible or impermissible for the slave to do using his speech. He is able to effectively engage in speech acts only because he has the authority to do so. The slave cannot do something similar. Um, as Langton and West are going to argue, porn only changes, uh, or the question that they're answering right now, porn only changes what is permissible or impermissible to do or say or believe if it has authority. So what they're talking about, um, you cannot step across this line, and it, this master really is the master of this slave, it is actually just the case that the slave can no or is no longer allowed to do that. So by saying you're not allowed to do this, the master has actually made it the case that the slave is no longer allowed to do it. So that would be an example of speaking with authority, allowing you to give uh, to perform these speech acts. Good. However, if the slave responds by saying, "Actually, I I am allowed to walk over that line," they are not actually doing anything with that statement because they lack the authority to do so. In other words, they are unable to engage in a sort of effective speech act. This brings them into how they're defining authority. Um, authority is the opposite of being silenced, according to Langton and West. So a way of being silenced in situations with power differentials is not to be prevented from uttering words. As I just said, the slave is able to say, no, I actually am allowed to move across that white line, but to be prevented from making certain intended moves in a language game. The slave is not appropriately allowed to say that, um, if they do say that, it doesn't change um, anything. It's, un it's ineffective, in other words. So to connect back to the baseball example earlier, if the slave says, no, I really can do that, they've said the words, but they haven't updated the score. All of the numbers stay exactly the same in that instance because yep. they don't have the authority. So as we saw in the last slide, Porn is able to make moves in a language game. It's able to update the score by adding presuppositions. It adds presuppositions that are necessary to make sense of storylines. Um, these preposition, presuppositions can include um, that women don't really mean no when they say no. Um, and as I'm going to explain in a second, the moves that porn makes or pornographers or porn writers or however you want to cash that out makes it the case that women are not able to challenge those moves effectively. Women are not going to be able to push back on the presuppositions made by um, porn in the same way that a slave is not able to effectively um, challenge what the master says. So um, here's the example um, with the master and the slave uh, that Ethan was explaining. If the master says cook dinner, this is an acceptable move in the language game. It does something. It makes it the case that the slave is supposed to go and make dinner. Um, the slave, on the other hand, if they say cook dinner to their master, this is an unacceptable move in a language game. It does nothing. Um, although they can utter the words, there is no meaning that is conveyed. There is no action that happens. Langton and West say that porn introduces the presupposition that women don't really mean no or that sexual violence is legitimate. Women are unable to say no or protest in ways that count as acceptable play. The reason why this is the case is because if the presupposition that is 
introduced is that women's no don't really mean no or that women secretly do want to be raped, then there's no way for women to effectively communicate that this isn't the case. Because anytime a woman actually says no, um, that isn't going to be taken up given the presupposition that no doesn't mean no, um, or against all protests women are actually enjoying what's going on. If we accept the presuppositions of porn, there is no way for women to effectively challenge those presuppositions because anything that they say plays into the narrative. Right. You get stuck in a position where no means yes, but yes also means yes. There's no effective way for women to say no. So women are stuck in this sort of bind. So this is kind of a complicated slide. Here's how I'm going to um, summarize and simplify it. I was trying to combine those words. Um, you have authority in a language game if you're able to change the score or if you're able to make certain moves. Porn, as we've seen previously, is able to change the score. It is able to make certain moves, given that it requires presuppositions to be accepted in order um, for the story to make sense. Now, we might say here, well, hey, maybe just porn doesn't make sense. Well, we're taking history into account. We know that um, um, men and pornographers, uh, we know there's been great success in the porn industry. Um, yeah, okay, hold on. I don't know what I'm saying there. Anyway, so porn is able to make certain moves in a language game <laughs> because it adds these presuppositions. Given the content of the presuppositions that it adds, women are unable to change the score in similar ways. They're unable to challenge these presuppositions effectively. Therefore, they are silenced. So if that's the case, then it seems to be the case that um, porn is a speech act which is serving to silence women. Right. Okay, the next potential objection, and this I think is probably a major one, uh, is the idea that, well, porn uh, just purports to be a fantasy. Um, how much can it really be saying if it's very clear that what it's saying isn't true? So first response, basically, uh, fiction is still able to change the, to perform changes in a language game fiction can still update the score. So they provide empirical evidence to support this. Um, people are more likely to believe rape myths when they're exposed to porn. Um, if you're more interested in what this empirical support looks like, um, you can check out footnote 29. Right. Uh, so yeah, there's we just have scientific evidence to believe that porn in fact does do this, despite being a fiction. Uh, this isn't limited only to porn, as we're going to see. Fiction in general just changes the language game. Right. And, okay, so one of the ways that it might do that is by being unclear exactly how fictional it is. So the example that they use is talking about Orson Welles' um, famous radio broadcast of The War of the Worlds as a radio play, um, where it was broadcast as though it was a news story about invading Martians, and everybody freaked out, um, thinking that it was true because it was not being clear how fictional it was um, exactly. So in this way, we can argue that porn, although yeah, it's fiction, it's not obviously enough fiction. Right. So here's how that can work. Um, it might be the case that porn is clear that it is depicting fictional events, but it might not, or it's not clear enough that it's depicting fictional events with fictional presuppositions. So as we say here, it's honest about the scenarios themselves being false. This specific action isn't a real one, uh, but the presuppositions that it requires in order to make sense of it, it is not clear that those are false. 
So going back to the example of um, Dirty Pool, it might be clear to um, consumers of porn that that's not really a waitress. There was no waitress. Um, the event never actually happened. The event happened. never actually happened, but it might not be clear that the background propositions that are required to make sense of the story are also fictional. These um, background propositions, like I mentioned before, are that women don't really mean no when they say no, women enjoy being raped, etc cetera, etc cetera. so although porn might be honest about the fact that the scenarios are fictional they aren't honest enough about how fictional the background propositions are or the background details right and this i think is connected to when they talk earlier about how it's harder to connect uh, to question the background assumptions in something they aren't being clear about their background uh, presuppositions. Those are just harder to get to. Um, they do use another example to talk about an instance where something is clearly a fiction, um, yet the background uh, propositions aren't quite as clear. Um, when they talk about historical fictions, if you're reading um, a book set in revolutionary France, uh, they give some examples, you might mistakenly pick out something that's supposed to be fictional as one of those true historical details. It's unclear exactly how fictional it's being. Yeah, so to just flesh that out slightly more, um, imagine you're reading Hillary Mantle's A Place of Greater Safety. This is a historical no novel about revolutionary France that doesn't purport to be nonfiction. It's obvious that it's fictional. You know that the main character isn't real. However, there are background details that might also be made up, such as events that happened, restaurants that existed, clothing that was worn, etc., etc., that isn't as clearly fictional. Someone who is reading this might pick up on new facts about what revolutionary France was like, even though those things never truly happened. Um, the idea here is that porn functions in a similar way. Just like you're unsure if, did that restaurant really exist when you're reading a historical novel? It might be the case that you would be unclear about whether or not re women really don't um, mean no when they say no or not. Okay, so to re- iterate everything that we've said and to condense it into um, the conclusions or the takeaways, what Langton and West are doing is they're fleshing out a specific defense of the censorship of um, a type of porn, um, specifically the type of porn that shows women um, in inferior roles, in extremely vulnerable positions, saying no when they really mean yes, um, or being raped and later enjoying it. Um, one response or pushback against um, the claim that this porn should be censored is that no, it's free speech. Assuming that porn is speech, we can assume that porn says things. So Langton and West are asking, what does it say and is it speech that harms? So they've shown us that porn says things implicitly by introducing presuppositions. These presuppositions change the language game in ways that silence and subordinate women by changing what counts as appropriate moves for women to make. By doing so, they make it the case that women can't effectively challenge the current presuppositions or act in ways that effectively communicate that they don't wish to have sex or that they aren't um, enjoying what is happening to them. In this way, it might be harming women. An implication of that is if porn is speech that harms, then the right to free speech may not protect it. In the same way that you can't yell fire in a movie theater, if your speech is harming someone else or putting someone um, at serious risk, then you still can't say it. Therefore, we may be justified in censoring um, at least certain types of porn. Um, we're going to talk in the discussion about whether or not you think they've 
um, effectively convinced you of this? And if so, um, what that might mean or how it might be done. Um, but that was their intent. Yeah, so this was the last lecture of the semester. Um, I want to say that I'm really sad that things moved online. I really enjoyed um, teaching you. Um, this has been or was at least at the beginning of the semester my favorite semester of teaching so far um and i'm sad that i didn't get to see it out in person um that being said i hope everybody is staying safe staying sane um and taking care of themselves as i said if you have any questions about what's due or what's coming up please be in contact with me. I will also be available after the end of class should you have questions about further classes to take um, or you're interested in continuing engaging with philosophy. Um, I'll send more information out about further opportunities to continue doing philosophy. Um, I hope you enjoyed the class as much as I did. And I wish you all the best, um, not only through the end of the world, but afterwards as well. All right. See ya.